Tech World. My name is Div Bansali, and joining us today is Joel Greenwald. He will be speaking on getting back to business, reopening the workplace, and rehiring employees in the current crisis. Also joining us today is Tom Provine, one of my co-workers here at Accountants World. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Um, uh, I say this in, uh, in every webinar, so bear with me if you've heard this before, but if you'd like to follow along with us on Twitter or if you'd like to share anything during the course of the presentation on Twitter, uh, make sure to use the hashtag expert webinar, which you see at the bottom center there. Um, that'll allow us to know that you're, uh, you're calling in and, uh, and we can interact with you there as well, answer any questions you may have, pass along or share couple of uh, tips on GoToWebinar before we get started with Joel. If you don't see the attendee control panel, look for the orange arrow to expand or hide the panel. You can select your audio options by opening the uh, audio section, select either telephone or computer speakers. If you select the phone icon, it will provide you with a call-in number and an access code. So you can dial in. If you have any questions for Joel, go ahead and write those in on the questions tab. Make sure to click send so that they're received here um, and he'll answer those later on. And um, we will be having, uh, and we also have a handout if you haven't downloaded it already. So you can go to the handouts tab and look for the PDF so you can follow along with Joel. This is the third uh, webinar of the year in the 2020 Expert Webinar Series. We have 10 more to go after this. Um, and all of the webinars um, share one unified purpose, which is to help you and your practice thrive. We build together, we bring together thought leaders from various different disciplines. As you see today, Joel Greenwald coming from a legal background. Uh, we've got Joel Sinken uh, talking about mergers, acquisitions, and transitions. In our next webinar, we've got webinars on technology and practice management and, uh, and the future of accounting. So, we have a number of different uh, avenues that we go in with these, and we're very excited to present this to you free of charge with CP credit available for each remaining webinar. So if you haven't signed up for the entire series, you can do so in just about 60 seconds by going to 2020-webinars.com, 2020-webinars.com, and you'll be signed up uh, for all of the remaining webinars, and then you can pick and choose whichever ones you'd like to attend from this point forward. I mentioned CP before. We do offer one CP for today's webinar, and that's based on active participation during the live presentation. Active participation means three things. Number one, you attend the live webinar for no less than 50 minutes. Number two, you respond to all polling questions. Uh, there will be three during this webinar. And number three, when you close out of the webinar, you'll see a post-webinar survey come up. Go ahead and fill that out and submit that as well. If you don't see the post-webinar survey window come up, no worries. We'll send you an email with another link to it as well, so you can fill it out from there. Um, you uh, you don't need to email us tomorrow morning and ask where your CPE is because CPE does take several business days to process and validate. Um, so you will be notified by email by end of this week or early part of next week. And also, please add webinar at accountantsworld.com to your trusted email list to make sure that emails from us get through to you. Also wanted to mention uh, another free resource that Accountants World is offering right now, um, which is called Emerging Stronger Than Ever, a Strategic Guide for Accountants in 2020. And the premise behind this is, uh, I, I think many firms that we've talked to have said that for the past two, three months, um, their entire focus has sort of been head down, um, helping their clients through their crises, managing their own practices and their own staff uh, through crises as well. And um, at some point, we will be past the sort of emergency crisis mode, and we're going to need to look further down towards the horizon and what's coming up in the future. And this is a great time to realign your client expectations and the needs of your clients to produce a win-win for both your firm and your clients as well. Your clients have never needed you more than they do right now. You've already shown them how much value you can provide and how much, they, how much help you can provide. And now is the perfect time to reshape some of your service offerings, potentially offer new services that you may have thought of uh, as being sort of out of your arm's reach previously. Um, and so this guide will show you how to get started on that, how to communicate the new offerings that you have to your clients, 
how to determine which service offerings make sense and how to price those as well. Um, so we're here to help you get that process started and, and do a real self-evaluation of what you and your clients need um, moving forward. So if you'd like to uh, go ahead and receive that free guide, which just came out yesterday, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the first poll question, which is simply, would you like us to email you this free guide? And again, it is a no obligation, totally free guide um, that we're providing to you. So if you're interested in receiving this to your email box sometime soon, go ahead and click yes. If not, no worries, go ahead and click no. Make sure to click submit after you vote so that your vote is counted. And this is actually the first of our three poll questions today. The poll questions obviously are required in order to earn CB credit. So whether your answer is yes or no, make sure to get your vote in so that you're able to earn CP credit today. And Div, I just want to jump in here. Uh, hi, folks. This is Tom Provine. I'm uh, one of the co-hosts today. Uh, there is a small glitch in GoToWebinar where if you have the presentation in full screen, uh, you will not be able to answer the poll questions. You have to minimize your screen in order to answer. Um, I've contacted GoToWebinar support about this um, and haven't necessarily heard a response, um, but we want to make sure that all the poll question uh, poll answers are tabulated. So just minimize from full screen, answer the poll question, and then you can maximize back into your full screen view. Thanks, Tom. I, I had forgotten to mention that. It's a good, good catch there. All right, so we've got about 90% of you have voted at this point. If you haven't, uh, we'll take about 10 more seconds here for folks to get their votes in. Remember to click Submit after you vote. All right, we are going once, going twice, and we are done. Okay, great. Um, thanks to all of you who have, uh, have selected yes there. Um, all right, so we will uh, proceed along here. A quick word about Joel Greenwald before I turn the presentation over to him and Tom. Joel is the managing partner at Greenwald Doherty, uh, a firm located here in New York and New Jersey. He's a leading authority on labor relations and employment law issues for a professional services firm, and has been a frequent lecturer to trade and professional groups and a contributing columnist to business journals as well. So at this time, I'd like to bring on and present Joel Greenwald. Hey, thanks, Deb. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, I am I'm really happy to be um, presenting to you guys today. I'm sitting in my home, which is nice. And uh, we do represent companies all over the country on their labor and employment law issues. And for us, it's a big deal right now to be on top of these issues for our clients. And I'll tell you one of the things that we're doing, which we've never done before because we're, we've never worked so so well remotely, uh, we've actually never worked fully remotely, is we're speaking to each other for 30 minutes a day at four o'clock every single day, every attorney in the firm, and just going over legislative issues, how they've applied to clients during the day. So we're finding ourselves um, really, really trying to keep on top of what we call a changing landscape. Uh, Tom, if you could switch the slide, that would be great. Um, so we do, we feel as if we are weather forecasters. Um, and you know, for us, um, we really are going to be talking about things that could be different tomorrow, could be different next week, could be different in a month. Things are changing so rapidly in the law that things that we were saying two months ago have changed maybe three or four times since then. That's because there's a massive amount of new information coming out, both legislative and otherwise. And for the most part, the law tends to move slowly in general. Now it's being forced to move so quickly. So we're, we're just going to be talking about employment law today and, and in the context of reopening now. Um, so I, I want to let you know, though, that it, it, you really, really can't make rapid decisions that um, don't take any consideration. We find that for us, we're happy that people are calling us now and emailing us in advance of the situation because I think there's going to be a coming storm of litigation in the very near future. And I think it's very, very important to really be deliberate about the decision making you're doing about everything we're talking about. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. This talk is informational only. Obviously, there's no privilege, it's not legal advice, but let's move on if we can. Let's go to the next slide if we could, Tom. Thanks. 
we just advance the slide? Yep, it should be advancing now. Okay, there we, good. There we are. So, you know, one of the things that um, that is going on is that there is a political divide. We're seeing it on the news every night, that's for sure, this past week. And before that as well, no matter what side of the fence anybody's on or if you're in the middle, um, it makes it hard to navigate this. Uh, and as we'll see in a few moments, and I'll talk about it, the fact that we're so divided, this pandemic and everything else related to that couldn't have hit us at a worse time. Um, when we are so divided because we really do need to have some clarity. And I think when there's such division, everything's very murky. So you got some states that are that are opening slowly, some states that are opening quickly. It depends often what political bent you are. Uh, and obviously the federal government is itching to reopen more quickly. Um, and in, in terms of um, states themselves, you've got some different rules for different locations in the states and all and, and, and within the state. You've also got to be aware of the fact that um, parts of the country, parts of each state um, are all opening up potentially at different paces um, depending on what level um, of um, readiness they're in based on the spread of the disease. So you have to be aware of that as well. Um, let's move on if we could to the next slide, please. Um, so what I want you to be aware of is that right up front, there's there's potentially a balancing test where there are these potential negligence-oriented wrongful death lawsuits that businesses should be slightly, con well, not slightly, they should be concerned with potentially. And there's discrimination issues, which we'll cover throughout um, this this next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, and, and And very often you're in a position where you may be forced to make some choices that, well, you know, I'm going to be pushing the limits on discrimination. I'm going to be, or I'm going to be pushing the limits on negligence. Um, so, you know, we'll be discussing the idea that some of the lawsuits that may be out there for businesses in the ne in the coming months, based on some decisions that are made now, is is that there's ADA oriented rules, um, disability discrimination is something that we're gonna to have to be very mindful of. Look, it wouldn't have been conceivable that you could have tested for somebody's temperature four months ago um, that was a worker in your company. Now, of course, that's something that the EEOC has said is okay. Um, it wouldn't be conceivable that you'd be uh, potentially invading some potential privacy issues that you are potentially allowed to do now four months ago, now you are, three months ago, whatever it was. Um, so there, there, there's there's one side that says that. Now on the other side, there's negligence lawsuits. And let me dive into that for a second. Um, now you may say, wait, somebody getting COVID at the workplace could potentially result in, the law, in a lawsuit. Well, there are already those lawsuits that are beginning to emerge, especially in some of the states that opened up or some of the essential workforces. We've seen a number of those lawsuits already. And one of the concerns that businesses have is, well, I'm afraid of reopening and having people sue me for getting COVID in the workplace. Now, there's some interesting dynamics there. One is, well, does workers' compensation insurance pick up? Well, that's not clear right now, and it varies state to state. Um, but you know, let's work with the assumption that right now it's not covering it because typically, you know, in, in, in a workplace injury situation, if somebody, let's say, loses their arm in a factory, um, they're going to potentially say that they were, you know, that there was a negligence issue and that it'll be preempted because it happened on the job and the company has workers' compensation insurance. And frankly, that's the reason they have that kind of insurance. Okay. It's one of the values of having an employee over an independent contractor is you've got the level of coverage for a disaster that may happen. Now, this is a little bit different because it's it's a virus. It's, it, it's, it's not like a piece of machinery or somebody slipping and falling at your workplace. It's a little bit different. Typically, workers comp does not pick up when somebody's got a virus like the flu. So it wouldn't pick up here. You can't because the, the, the thought is, is that there's no proof that they got the virus at the job. So that's, you know, that's out there right now. So where was the virus contracted? It's a difficult thing and the burden of proof of demonstrating that somebody received COVID at the workplace is probably gonna be pretty difficult, but nonetheless, it's a lawsuit. 
okay? And it's a potential lawsuit out there. So one of the things that you're seeing from the federal government is that there's an interest in potentially protecting companies from liability with some sort of a liability shield. What does that look like? You know, who knows? Now the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other like organizations, and um, and, and, and I know that certain members of the Republican Party are advocating for this protection from negligence lawsuits. And they really want that to be actively part of the, um, the, the coming legislative initiatives that we're expecting. Now, you know, there's new stimulus packages and maybe that's part of that, but obviously the unions, plaintiffs, lawyers, and, and, and other folks feel that, well, negligence lawsuits are a good check um, to make sure that workplace safety is kept intact and that workers remain safe. So maybe there's some sort of a compromise that if, if, uh, um, if there are in fact some standards that are followed, maybe OSHA oriented standards, and I'll get into that in a second, um, maybe, maybe then, uh, you know, if it's not gross negligence and people have adhered to certain things, maybe then there will be a liability issue. But right now it's an unknown situation. And like I said, we're forecasting things. We don't know where this is gonna go. It's unpredictable. And who knows if in a month from now, whether whether works, workers' comp picks up or there's some sort of liability shield, whether or not there'll be exposure for negligence lawsuits or not. But it is rather unprecedented um, for have, to have a massive amount of potential lawsuits out there for employees that potentially pick up a virus within the workplace. So that's something to really keep on your radar. And you know, one of the things that a lot of companies are doing is really prioritizing their safety because they're concerned with that. And sometimes they may be even pushing the envelope in terms of some of the other laws on the other side of the fence, as I mentioned before, some of the privacy issues, some of the discrimination issues. Now I'd be careful about doing that because that may be something that actually doesn't go, you know, doesn't go away as easily as, an, as some of the negligence issues. And you have to be very careful that you're staying on the right side of the law there as well. If we could advance the slide, Tom, that'd be helpful. Thank you. So, you know, let's talk about the plan for reopening and let's talk about some of the safety measures that companies are beginning to take. And we're working with companies to make sure that uh, their safety plans slash policies are all, are all potentially clearly written because there's communication issues now and that um, they're not violating any laws um, as best we can see. So one of the things that I would ask you is at this point in time, I think the first poll question is, um, and, and Tom, you wanna read that first poll question? Put that up? Yes, okay. I will. Uh, just uh, one second here while I launch that poll question. All righty. So folks, the poll is open. Uh, and it's a very simple one. It's how many of you have developed a safety plan? So it's a simple one. Uh, yes, we have developed a safety plan and no, we have not developed a safety plan. So okay. just a reminder, uh, real quick, uh, just wanna remind the audience that answering uh, this, the second and the third poll questions, it's, it is required for CPE credit today. Great. So I, you know, I, I guess we'll, we'll we'll continue talking now, but we'll we'll have a result on that poll question in a short while. Um, but I would say that um, one of the things that you want to be mindful of here is the fact that um, you want to start thinking about who is going to be putting this plan together, and whether you're a small business, a medium-sized business, or a large business somebody's got to be in charge so it may be time that you had a chief safety officer okay now that could be somebody that's an hr director it may be a uh, um, it may be a chief of operations it may be somebody you bring in from the outside that actually has some experience with safety you're going to potentially have a safety budget uh going forward and you're going to have to be thinking about safety because this isn't going away so quickly and and, and these things may reappear and companies have to be thinking that way so you may want to have a committee that helps put the plan together. But I like the idea of having at least a single person that potentially receives complaints or you know, uh, information from employees about certain things should things arise. So I think that that's a good move. Just the same way you have a human resources director that potentially is the major source of sexual harassment or discrimination complaints and the like. So I think that that's very, very important. Um, and you know, what measures 
are you implementing in terms of you know what goes into your safety plan how are you producing it um are you going to unveil it in phases is it going to all happen at once or are you going to get back to work in gradual um and gradual levels which a lot of companies i know are doing and i think very important how are you communicating um the, this plan slash policy to your employees i would certainly like whatever you produce um to be and i think something obviously has to be produced in writing and i think it has to be signed as received by employees that would be my best practice opinion here um there's you know law most laws are you know very diverse on what's needed state to state it's variable but you know many of you have clients or operations yourselves in various locations and i think you have to be mindful of the fact that it's hard now to train employees on some of these safety measures. You're gonna do the best you can to do it over Zoom or when they actually get back there, but it may be hard to do this in mass. So what you say within your plan slash policy, I think needs to be very clearly articulated and I'd like to have some sort of confirmation of its receipt. I would not minimize the importance of that. I think it's very, very important in a time where you know it is more difficult to train folks. Um, let's go to the, do we have a result of the poll yet? Yes, we do. I will share it right away. All righty. So folks, if you see 62% uh, said yes, we have developed a safety plan and 38% said uh, we have not developed a safety plan. Uh, Joel, that seems like a, a pretty good number. Obviously, we'd like to see the 38% yeah. you know, come up uh, a little bit, but... No, I'm impressed by it, but I think that, you know, and it could be that some of the people that say they developed the safety plan, it's not finalized yet, it's a work in progress, and uh, uh, you know, I, I get that, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I, I, I think, though, that um, I want you to think of your safety plan as a living, breathing organism that could potentially change shape as time goes on. Let's think about it. A couple of months ago, we were not necessarily encouraged to wear masks. Now everybody's being encouraged to wear masks. Um, it was a big deal to wash groceries when they came in a month ago. Now there's some evidence that suggests that it's not, um, you know, surfaces are a little harder to catch the virus as it was before. So, you know, without any 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 um, judgments on that, because obviously we're all learning. Um, all I'm suggesting is is that you know you may be putting things in your safety plans right now that potentially need to be changed over time. And I would think that whatever format you have that in, be flexible, okay? To potentially be open to changing things as um, science even necessitates or legal requirements necessitate. Now look, if you're looking for guidance for your plan and to keep making your plan better and better, um, look, look, you certainly can look to the CDC um, and their website uh, has a lot of suggestions. Um, OSHA, obviously, the, the it, it is consumed with occupational safety. So, and, and listen, within OSHA, there also is um, the possibility that they could potentially audit you as a company and make sure that you your your safety planning is up to snuff because it's possible that employees could complain to them. And there also is a retaliation provision so that if they make a complaint and you take an adverse action against the employee that's potentially problematic and also the eeoc which is the equal employment opportunity commission which potentially um, gives guidance on a regular basis as to um what is uh and not isn't is not allowed and so far you know in terms of testing like i said that they they, they have suggested that testing is okay Whereas, you know, that's the kind of thing that you just wouldn't, it would be somewhat unheard of under federal discrimination law. Um, the state and local authorities are a wealth of information and you need to look at what they're saying and adhere to what guidance they're giving. And there may be affirmations that you need to make. Some of them, I know some states, for example, like New York, have um, model safety plans, templates that you can access through the Department of Health. Um, so the Department of Health is one, one um, and various states have their own versions of that. Um, th th those are good resources for you. You know, obviously, you know your company best. And one of the things that I would encourage companies to look at potentially is um, industry associations. And for accountants, there are some industry associations, best practices is within offices. 
Although, you know, most accounting offices, like most professional offices, are, are, are you know, set up pretty similarly. So some of the, the guidance that you may be able to get could be from legal and other like kinds of businesses. Um, and certainly, um, as I mentioned before, you know, it, it's one thing to have this, this as an idea that's in your head. Um, it's one thing to have this scribbled on a notepad, but this has to be clear. Um, it has to be clear in terms of employees really being able to understand it. Obviously, if you've got um, people that are fluent in other languages and not fluent in English, make sure you get it translated. Um, but I, I want it signed. And there's the subtle difference between a plan and a policy. And I've seen some companies um, have a plan and then put things in a policy because, it, you know, in a policy, it may be a little more illustrative about how to make a complaint, should there be an issue or how to go forward with some changes um, if, if, if changes are suggested. So there, there's, and communicate what an employee's role is within the context of the plan. So there, there but I've seen plenty of companies just issue a plan, but I would suggest with them, they almost have a policy like signature space with some of the other things. And I'm being repetitive about that, but I think it's very, very important. Let's go on to the next slide if we could. You know, these are some of the things that we're seeing um, from both the, the guidance that you get on, uh, on the websites that I talked about and some of the clients that we've seen. We've, you know, like I said, we have offices out West and we've already been um, helping companies with some of their safety plans. And, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that not only are companies making sure that they have PPE available for, um, for employees, but they also are testing um, uh, whether it be temperatures or potentially for COVID. And you know, you're seeing a cottage industry right now emerge of testing companies that are actually going to the workplace and taking uh, whether it be temperatures or, 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 or testing um, for active uh, COVID antigens. And, um, you know, and, and, and one of the questions, obviously, about is about the antibody tests to demonstrate that COVID has been potentially present in um, people's systems um, in the past and that they may have developed some sort of immunity. Um, I, I just comment on that, that the CDC has not necessarily advocated for that. And um, it's a question whether or not those things can be determinative. And we're not necessarily recommending those. Um, as something that's a priority ahead of these other tests for uh, companies. Listen, there's problems with all of these tests potentially. Certainly with temperature taking, there's some privacy issues. Um, you know, are, 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 are you keeping track of people's temperatures? Are you, you know, writing them down? Well, maybe that's, that's, that's health condition oriented material. You're, you're potentially getting into some HIPAA issues. Um, I certainly would recommend that, you know, it's, if, you, if let's just say hypothetically the, bur the, the barrier for, for having temp a temperature that people have to go home with is 100.4, which is the CDC recommendation, although some states vary on that, um, would you potentially, um, would you want uh, um, to keep that, the, the records in your personnel files? I would say you don't do that. Um, you know, the, the thing is that there's a lot of, fact-based decision-making that you're going to have to make. So in a webinar like this, I could give you general rules, but I think that, um, you know, we've seen some companies um, have employees just do questionnaires on a daily basis where they're answering a series of questions and, and submitting it every day, including that they've taken their temperature, they don't have temperature, they haven't encountered anyone that had COVID, and those kinds of questions as well. And there's some value to that also. Um, also, you know, you're, you see employers monitoring symptoms. People are coming in with COVID-like symptoms, chills, fever, potential uh, 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 severe cough. Um, th that's the kind of thing that we're, we're seeing companies send people home, um, obviously. And, 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 you know, they're willing to, like I said, once again, balance potential disability discrimination risks versus dis um uh, versus potential safety slash negligence risks. And it is a, it's going to become a, a constant balancing test. Obviously, the hygiene, both personal hygiene and um, uh, hygiene uh, of the office space, the office facilities or, or, the, um, or whatever kind of workplace somebody works in, um, I, I think are very, very important. Social and physical distancing, um, different places have different regulations. Obviously, 
Many are going with that six feet number, but that of course could change to make sure people aren't within a certain vicinity of each other. Common area rules, maybe the coffee machine doesn't work for a foreseeable future. Maybe people aren't to gather within the meal areas um, like the cafeteria or the kitchen. Um, and you know what you're seeing is, is that companies are gonna continue to do um, um, virtual meetings, virtual parties, for the foreseeable future. I, I am seeing a lot of companies stagger shifts so that they maybe have people come in on different days. Also, many people are continuing to allow people to telecommute and making it voluntary for the foreseeable future. Some businesses can do that easier than others. Obviously, um, white collar um, uh, type businesses like accounting or law could probably do it easier than manufacturing or those kinds of businesses where people physically need to be there and that's a lot more challenging. So obviously if you can continue to telecommute pe people that, that wanna stay that way, that is optimal. Um, you know, I see many companies saying we're staggering shifts, but we're making it voluntary should you wanna come in. But if you come in, you can't all come in together. So look, that seems like a reasonable play in many respects when companies are able to become open to have that that kind of an open-mindedness i think uh, makes a lot of sense in many occasions um certainly physical changes to the work site such as barriers um that are erected I, you know the, the, certainly the the open workplace with the low carols um and uh, people all working next to each other sharing tables and things like that well you know you, you're, you're gonna have to reconfigure that certainly i've seen stairways and hallways now have one-way signs just like they do at supermarkets um obviously better signage maybe you're going to re-engineer some of the airflow um, i've seen certain types of businesses um, make sure that air is purified in, in in certain ways now i'm not exactly sure how they do that whether it's uv light or other things but um i know some of our clients have begun to um, invest in that technology um, obviously, if there's an outbreak, you want to be um, you want to foresee that and outline what you're potentially going to do as part of your planning. Um, whether you report it to the health agencies in the various states you're operating in, um, do some contact tracing. Remember, be mindful of some of the HIPAA issues, the privacy issues when you're looking for the source. And obviously, you're going to have to probably disinfect the area in its entirety again, or at least in the areas that that employee um, or employees were located. And that's going to be potentially an expensive thing to do, but um, I think that that's one of the things I said that you're gonna probably have to earmark some budget or the clients that you represent are gonna have to have budgets for safety. Certainly the visitor, vendor and delivery rules should be adjusted. Um, you know, in certain businesses, there's not a constant flow of customers coming through. Obviously law and accounting and those kinds of businesses and some of um, the service sector, they do have clients that come through, they do have people delivering packages that come through, but it's not the same thing as a grocery store where, or, or, or an electronic store or somewhere where you've got, or a clothing store where, where people are coming through on a constant basis. Certainly retail is a lot more challenging. Um, to, in, in terms of these modifications. But I think that it's important to be mindful of that and be thinking about that. Also, um, I see companies canceling non-essential travel, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's, uh, let's, so, so there's a trade show. Just lastly, uh, if there's a trade show, and you could advance the slide, Tom, um, thanks. If there's, a, if there's a trade show coming up, you know, in the fall, uh, let's think about, uh, to be, it's a TBD, to be determined, you don't know yet what you're going to do in a lot of occasions. I certainly don't think you do. The way things were four months ago, who knows what they're going to be four months from now. Um, everything's changing rapidly in our world now. Now, um, you know, you're, you're unlikely to bring back everybody when you bring them back. Um, as I said, you know, people may re-employ people um, all at once because a lot of people have laid off people and you may be bringing people back for the PPP loans or just bringing the back in general, back onto payroll from a layoff or a furlough. Um, you need to make some choices there. There, obviously, if you know, you're just bringing people back onto the payroll, I think you wanna be cognizant of making your choices in a non-discriminatory way. So the more objective you are bringing people back based on 
let's say the first ones back are the most senior employees, the people that have worked for you the longest, or they have the highest sales numbers, the highest billable hours, all that stuff. That's certainly the optimal way to think about it. But I understand many companies are going to bring people back uh, based on you know who are the strongest performers first onto their payroll. And I get that also. Um, just understand that some of the legal protections um, in terms of being accused of discrimination based on your selections won't be available to you then because it's it's a subjective reason. Nonetheless, I you know uh, it, it's part of the business decision making that every company has to do. I would certainly like you to document some of the decision making um, if, if you are making them based on potential objective reasons, as I mentioned above. Now, getting back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, which is safety. Um, so one of the things that I see companies sometimes doing in error is making a decision that, you know, we're not going to bring you back because you've got diabetes or you're 70 years old or, you know, one of the, the things that the EEOC outlines that there's a bunch of conditions now um, that are subject to certain disability oriented protections over the age of 65, for example, um, within the context of what we're speaking about now. Um, people that have heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, moderate to severe asthma, those kinds of things, okay? It's not necessarily for you to make that decision. That's generally not what you should be doing. There are some, some rare exceptions to that, but for the most part, that's not for you to decide. That it would be better if those people came to you and wanted an accommodation. So let's go on to the next slide if we can. So if people come to you with, um, with a disability um, accommodation request, okay, um, you know, one of the things that you're going to be thinking to yourself is, well, do I have something that I could give them? In other words, you know, people come to you and they're like, I've got one of these underlying conditions, I'm over the age of 65, um, or I've got a anxiety disorder, which is a mental disorder that I've been, um, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've got a mental disability and I potentially can't come into the workplace. Remember, if you can accommodate people to continue to work remotely, now this is not just bringing people back from the payroll, I'm talking about now bringing people back into um, the actual facility because, you know, people obviously can continue to work remotely we're not making a big adjustment. It's one of the reasons that you see a lot of white collar businesses waiting for quite a while because they don't wanna make some of these difficult decisions. Um, so this is a difficult case by case situation because you will see some people saying that they don't wanna potentially come back to work and you need to ask them why. And if it's because they need an accommodation, you need to seriously consider whether or not you should give it to them or not. And generally the rule of thumb is that if the, the accommodation is a reasonable accommodation request and it does not pose an undue hardship on the company, you've got to grant it. And that's typical disability discrimination law. And that's been the way it's been for a long, long time. So, um, you know, but remote working, uh, saying that that people working remotely is something that we don't, we don't necessarily support because it's, uh, it's it's not the way we do business. It's a little bit of a harder argument now than it was a year ago because we've seen that we can do it and it potentially doesn't pose an undue hardship. Let's move the slide if we could. So, you know, one of the things that I think companies have to be concerned about is if they are recalling people to work and let's say hypothetically they can't work people remotely and they have to work them uh, in person, well, you know, it's hard to operate a business when people don't want to come back to work. So, you know, I, I think that's a real concern. Um, I think that now would be a good time probably for the second polling question, if we could. Uh, yes, I will take care of that right now. Alrighty, let's just open that polling question here. And launch that. All right, folks, you should be seeing the uh next poll question here so the question reads how many have you had people who are unwilling to return to the office uh the answers are our entire staff wants to return to work 75 percent of our staff wants to return to work it's about 50 50 75 percent of our staff does not want to return and then our entire staff does not want to return and yeah, so i think the purpose of understanding this question we're talking about 
not necessarily returning onto payroll, but returning to the physical location. That's correct. And just to uh, just to add in here, uh, Joel, you know, internally at Accountants World, we had a um, we had a poll about uh, uh, returning to our office because we're obviously located in New York and not in our office as well. And it's interesting to hear the different perspectives from people about whether or not they want to return to the office environment um, and and what I'm, you know, it's it's interesting to hear those different perspectives from people. So that's for yeah. sure. It, 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 we're, we're seeing that's all over the map right now. So just going on, if, if you if you have um, folks that are that are out sick, you know, obviously you can request some documentation before they come back in. But what if they're just afraid uh, to come back and, and and they believe they're not safe? Well, one of the reasons that I want you to communicate your safety plan and policies to them is I want them to know all the things that you're doing to make your workplace safer. And obviously, if they come to work or suggest things that aren't safe at work and you potentially take an adverse action against them, let's say you fire them or you put them on unpaid leave as a result of and it was short, in close proximity to them making a complaint like that, you potentially run the retaliation risk and you potentially invite a lawsuit also, as I said before. So I think you'd be very careful with that. But I think that now is the time to be compassionate. People will remember how you treated them now, later on. And so I think you really do want to understand what they're thinking. But then again, you do have a business to run. Now, I've seen employers offer people hazard pay, and I understand that as well. And I think there's some, um, there's some value to that. I've also seen people offer some money in exchange for people um, um, uh, signing a waiver. I've seen people not offer money uh, for, for folks uh, signing a waiver to come in. And a waiver could be that they, they waive um, their right to sue a company for the liabilities we spoke about before, should they come back and get COVID. Now, my opinion on that, and we're not really negligence lawyers, we're employment lawyers, is that there are potential problems with those waivers. There's some value to them potentially, but there are potentially also some problems. I'm going to be a little wishy-washy on them because, you know, whether or not those things are definitely enforceable is a good question. Um, you know, there, there may be enforceability challenges in certain instances to a waiver because it's just, you know, it, it, just like liquidated damages clause and those indemnity clauses that people have in contracts aren't always enforceable. Maybe a waiver is and people could say that they were coerced. And there's things that you could do to balance against that. And you could argue that there it's a good deterrent against people thinking that they could do something. You could also make the argument it may be bad PR to make people sign away those rights. But 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 there's there, there's lots of considerations that go into it, you know. And I've seen some clients do I think a pretty smart thing as well, which is have people sign a notice that they understand that they're coming back into this situation. They understand that that that, that there is a risk. They understand all these other things. And I think that there's some value to that apart from just the plan policy about safety we talked about, and maybe something that's a little lower key than a waiver, but also may have some effectiveness. So, you know, there's a lot of choices to make here. Um, one of the things also is that we are certainly seeing that companies are struggling with people that are receiving high benefits in unemployment that have been laid off or furloughed and don't want to be recalled because um, either they're concerned with the safety or they're getting paid too much to stay at home. And that's, a, that's been a concern for a lot of businesses in this situation for a long time. The thing that I would certainly recommend you do there is at the very least um, write them um, that they have been offered a job and that they have um, denied coming back in. They, they, they have um, refused to, to, um, to accept. Um, and you may not take further action other than potentially obviously going to the Department of Labor and letting them know that you've offered the person a job back, which some locations and some jurisdictions are mandating that you do and is probably sensible. Now, at the very least, one of the reasons you want to have confirm in writing that you've offered them a job and they refuse to accept is if you're after getting your full time equivalency numbers up for your PPP loan, um, that is within the Treasury Department's advisory and their, their FAQs, which probably many of you being accountants have, have been reading, and you want to make sure that your full-time equivalents are up as much as possible. Can we look at the poll result? Yes, absolutely. We're opening it right now, so let's close that poll. 
and let's share these results with everyone. So uh, it looks like a little over half of the people say that their staff wants to return to work. Um, and then 23% said uh, they're about 50-50 on returning to work uh, there, Joel. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting. That's pretty high in terms of it. And I, and I think that that probably goes to the factor that, you know, when we're thinking about um, we're thinking about safety in the context of locations, office locations are probably lower down than some, than some other companies. So yeah, let's move on to the next slide if we can. Got to move move along here. Um, now in terms of if we could, yeah that one, um, you know when you're bringing people back, whether it's bringing them back from furlough or a layoff, and you're reemploying them, um, just make sure. And this is a note that I I didn't want to lose here is that if they're coming back off of a layoff it's a little bit different than coming off of a furlough because you you could make an argument that a layoff is more of a formal separation furlough they've just been put on the sideline but they're still potentially working at the company um, and if they're coming off of a layoff it, i think it's probably advisable for you to have them sign the startup documentation whether it's a uh, an offer letter a uh, wage theft prevention notice if your state has something like that or potentially a um an arbitration agreement, a commission agreement, an on-compete agreement, you may want to go through the process of having those folks sign them again. I think that's certainly advisable because they could make a colorable argument that they were re-employed a second time and they weren't asked to sign these things, so they aren't in effect. I wouldn't take that chance. Uh, let's go to the next slide if we can, please. Um, now, one of the things here is, and I, and I imagine many of you in the audience are very, very familiar with the CARES Act PPP program and the forgiveness um, uh, um, uh, applicability here. Obviously, um, you know, there's some potential discussion now about expanding the eight weeks to either 16 or 24 weeks or what, whatever, um, but, and, and, and it looks like there's a strong possibility that may happen. Um, but just be mindful of the fact that as of now, we're still sitting, as far as I know, um, but this could change if someone uh, listens to this a week later. Um, it may be down and there's a movement to, there's a suggestion um, to, to make it go to 60%. Um, and the legislation may go that way um, in terms of 60% of your, right now it's 75% of the forgivable um, total needs to be within the payroll or payroll related expenses. So obviously if, you know, you've um, um, if you've got only $150,000 in payroll expenses, then potentially, as we sit here today, then only $50,000 um, during that eight-week period, or you know, whatever that period is um, or becomes, um, then you would only be allowed to put in $50,000 in rent, mortgage interest, um, and, 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 and utilities and things like that, because it has to be in a, in a three-to-one ratio. Obviously, as I mentioned, the full-time equivalency match, that could also diminize uh, on, on top of not hitting the payroll ratios I just discussed. If your full-time equivalents are less now than they were within the lesser of those two previous periods from last year or earlier this year, then you potentially um, run the risk of diminizing your full-time equivalency match. For example, if you had 90, 100 employees last year and 90 employees this year, this is being overly simplistic, you know, it would be a further 10% diminution of uh, your forgiveness. Obviously, um, the loan's still a low interest loan, so if you're not fully forgiven, there's there's things there, but you just wanna make sure that you adhere to some of the things I just talked about, some of the safe harbors. For example, if to get your full-time equivalency numbers up, if you're recalling people and they're not willing to work, let's get some confirmation to that effect. Let's go to the next slide if we can. Now, in terms of the state we're in now, employer avoidance of liability, I think is going to be more challenging than ever in the coming weeks and months. And there's no question that you've got to be smart about it. From our perspective, you know, we feel that 15 minute call here or there as a, as, as a real good um, move, it's, it's a really good move if you want to potentially make the right decisions and from from our perspective uh you know that's what we're doing a lot of right now people are calling us um to make help them make some decisions that are very very challenging because you want to do everything you can to be mindful of 
the fact that even if it's a lawsuit that's winnable, a lawsuit's a lawsuit and it takes you out of your game. It could cost you a lot of money, but at the very least, it's a big distraction. And who needs a distraction when we've got so many distractions right now? So I think that it's very, very important that you really be deliberate, as I said at the very beginning, about your decision making because there's so many potential risks that are out there. I guess let's go to the next slide. And I don't know if there's that that's my contact information. So I don't know if we have time for any questions, but if we don't have time for any questions, that's my it's on the that's my contact information. So feel free to reach out to me um, and I'll be happy to see what I could do. Um, and, and, and we're there to help. Um, so, Tom, are, are we are there any are there questions or I think we're at 251. So I don't know what that leaves us with. Yes, we do actually have um, we have some questions. So Hilda uh, asked us, uh, what do you suggest a sole proprietorship with no employees uh, do to obtain safety measures? Well, I listen, even if it involves just you, you may be interacting with people that come by your office and come to you or come by your, you know, your location. Like I said, there's visitors, there's vendors, there's clients. I think you need to have the right setup. Uh, it depends on a lot of variables, but I, I wouldn't dismiss it just because you're a sole practitioner. Um, you know, whether it's PPE masks for visitors, or maybe you know you want to make sure that that uh, that 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 they're not contaminating a space that may be a shared space. I really think it depends on the situation. So this is very very fact specific, but I wouldn't dismiss making sure that you're adhering to your jurisdictions safety measures and if you have any questions about that let me know i'm happy to talk to you about it but hilda i i think that you need to be um you know you need to still be mindful of safety practices even if it's you yourself because i suspect there may be other people that come by as well okay great and uh angel asked if FD, fte counted as 40 hours per week or 30 hours per week well, the current, you know, we were thinking 30 for a long time, but the most recent guidance seems to be implying it's 40. So could that change? Who knows? Everything's changing. But right now, as we sit, it, it, you know, at, at, to best of my knowledge, it's sitting at 40. All right. And then a question I actually had for you, uh, Joel, and you can expand on this. Do you think you mentioned that there's going to be a lot more virtual uh, offices, a lot more people working from home? Uh, do you foresee that the traditional office space might be going by the wayside? And how do you think that that'll affect uh, sort of labor law going forward? Well, it's a good, good question. And, and, and we're trying to figure that out. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it may slow, you know, it's going to come back, but in a different form. And I think that, you know, there's been projections of virtual working for a long time. And this whole pandemic probably just accelerated everything by about 10 years. Uh, that being said, it's hard to do certain things virtually that can be done in person. I mean, listen, I, you know, I, I, I think that every one of us would, would, would like to be around people more often. Um, but then again, there's some conveniences about working remotely that are great. So maybe there, you know, things become more of a hybrid going forward. And some people do certain things uh, one way or the other. I, I think, though, that it doesn't completely go away. But I think certain functions. Um, are, are going to be more challenging for the immediate future. Uh, I, I certainly think that performance management, which is you know like the paper trail type stuff that managers need to be trained on with respect to how employees are performing, is probably a lot more difficult. Okay, well it's not probably it is more difficult because we've had plenty of folks that have had people work remotely that we've represented for many years, and it is more difficult to do um, both do the training of the managers, but more than that make sure that the managers are effectively communicating what is or isn't satisfactory with their performance. Uh, people are able to potentially um, work a little bit differently um, working remotely. But, you know, I also think that what folks are going to do is bonus structures may change where people are graded more on output and productivity versus FaceTime and hours and things like that, because those things will be easier to gauge. But I think there's going to be a lot of changes coming out of all this, some good, maybe some not so good. Oh, a very interesting question. Uh, we don't have any more uh, questions here. Um, Joel, I want to thank you very much for joining us in our expert webinar series. 
Uh, just a little background, Joel joined us for a uh, one-off webinar on employment law last year, and we were floored and really excited about his expertise in this area. So we invited him back for our expert webinar series this year, and this was a great, timely presentation. And, and Joel, we really appreciate uh, having you on. Uh, I'm going to uh, send things over to Div to close up, but uh, folks, thank you so much, and uh, I'll send things over to Div. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Div. All right, thank you, Tom, and uh, and again, thanks, Joel, for all the information today. This is very helpful and obviously very, very time timely here. Um, so we are excited to uh, continue to bring you very, very timely information. Uh, you know, a lot of these presenters we um, we had had um, sort of agreed to present in our expert webinar series two or three months ago, uh, sometimes even more than that. And obviously, the world changed quite a bit in the meantime. And, um, and presenters are doing a great job of adjusting their content um, to be sort of uh, more pertinent and specific to our time. So uh, obviously, Joel Greenwald did a fantastic job with that today. We thank him for that. We have another Joel coming up in just over two weeks, June, June 18th. Uh, that is Joel Sinkin. He's the president of Transition Advisors. He's a leading authority on mergers and acquisitions in CPA firms. And this time he'll specifically be talking about trends that are occurring there, including the impact of the current coronavirus. So um, if you'd like to learn more about what is available out there and what's changing in terms of merger and acquisition uh, opportunities for CPA firms um, and, and firms of all types, this is a great, uh, great chance to sort of learn from somebody who's probably at the forefront of that issue. So if you haven't signed up for all of this year's expert webinars, Again, simple way to do it, just go to 2020-webinars.com, 2020-webinars.com, and you can go ahead and sign up for all of the remaining expert webinars. It takes you probably about a minute to go ahead and do that, and you'll be notified when each one is coming up so that you can select the ones you'd like to attend. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks to Joel for his time. Thank you, Tom, for your effort today as well, and we'll look forward to seeing all of you in two weeks.